Hello, V Gates, how you all doing? We are in for a real treat. I think this is going to be one of the highlights, not just of today, not just of this stage, but of the entire convention. Uh, we're going to be hearing about the future of our relationship with space, with the cosmos, and how digital technology can help us understand and interact with this beautiful universe around us. Uh, but before we start, I just want to tell you, uh, those of you who haven't been here at this stage before, that you get to be a big part of this conversation. Uh, using the Me Convention app, uh, if you haven't got it on your phone yet, do download it. You can post your questions, your ideas, your thoughts, your inspirations, and they'll get uh, passed directly to Sasha, uh, the speaker here. So please do that. From the minute Sasha starts speaking, you can post your questions and so on. All right, so we have for you Sasha, uh, Sasha Simochina, who is one of the big brains at NASA. And she's going to be talking to you about our relationship with space and the way that art and technology can interact with science and the universe in the most amazing way. So please give a big Me Convention welcome and hello to Sasha. They would rotate the stage the whole time so I could be like, um, hi, welcome. Thank you for being here. I'm really excited to speak to you today. Um, what a wonderful introduction and also kind of scary to say I'm a big brain at NASA. I'd like to just say that's not true. <laughs> um, and I'll be talking about that today. So hi, everybody. Um, my name is Sasha Samoshina. Um, I am an immersive visualization producer at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And I will speak more about this title and J JPL as an idea. But first, I want to start out by kind of introducing myself a little bit and uh, so you can connect to me uh, and see what my path has been in the world of art and science. So uh, here's me uh, at like nine years old. Uh, nothing's changed. Uh, I was going to wear that dress, but I couldn't find it. Um, so I always try to kind of I was always asked to compartmentalize what I liked. So those things were art, music, computers, technology, and science. So growing up, it was always like, which one are you going to choose? Which one is it? And I could never really choose one because I liked them all. So I think throughout my life, I've been trying to be like, which one is it? I don't know. Um, I don't think that the answer is very black or white. Um, so. Struggling with that my whole life, um, when going to university, I chose to go to art school at the last minute, much to the chagrin of my parents who were like, you were going to be a scientist, what happens? And I would like, uh, I'm going to be a painter now. And they were like, oh, cool. Um, so I went for painting, um, but quickly my... Uh, <laughs> Quickly, my, um, my teachers didn't like that all I wanted to paint was sparkly ponies, and I don't know why. I was just like, this is what I want to do, and I'm 19, and it doesn't matter. Um, so having an OK head on my shoulders, I switched to a film video and new media. So at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, um, which was great because it was really a conceptual school. So they weren't like, make films or make videos. It was like, make stuff about stuff you want to talk about, which was broad enough for me to start thinking about science communication as a goal. Um, new media, I think, basically meant the internet at that point. So this is, I think that's what the internet is, right? That's what it is. It's a hedgehog surfing. Um, I just wanted to really show this slide. I really had no reason. Just, I really, it's just so cool, right? Um, so while my time, during my time at the School of the Art Institute, I got an internship at the Field Museum of Natural History in Chicago. It's a gorgeous museum. Um, there is a great museum in the middle of America. It, it, it exists. Uh, so I started working there as a media producer. And I want to make this connection to say that 
it's really the first place that I saw science and art combining together and making this beautiful new thing. So I was lucky enough to work on about 10 exhibits, one of them being a permanent exhibit called Restoring Earth, um, which if you're at the museum, you can still see it. Um, one of the greatest programs that they had at the Field Museum, which we spoke about in this exhibit, um, is called Rapid Inventory Programs. Rapid inventory programs are basically a bunch of scientists from the Field Museum go to a part of the Amazon that's being endangered. They go and they take biological information, so plants, animals, and people, compile all of that into a document, and then make a case to the government to save that amount of land. My part of it was making supplementary animations and videos for these presentations. Um, while I was there and when this exhibit opened in 2011, they had done 13 rapid inventory programs and all of them had saved land in the Amazon. So it was the first time that I was like, oh, this little animation of deforestation that I made, made a helped make the case to save this land. And then I became obsessed with the idea of connecting to people in this really kind of unique way. Um, so enter NASA, right? Uh, <laughs> there was a lot of stuff in between that and NASA, but I think that's the kind of the best connection to make. Um, so before I get into the specifics of my job, I want to just give you a little bit of background about JPL, um, which is a center of NASA in Pasadena, California. Um, there are many NASA centers. There are around 10 around the country. Um, Pasadena is in the mountains in San Gabriel Valley. Um, Basically, the way JPL was started was a bunch of seven guys at Caltech started trying to shoot things into space. And the, because of an accidental, uh, unintended explosion, as they like to call it, the head of Caltech said, how about you guys go about eight kilometers uh, away from here and start doing those tests over there? So that's how JPL started. Um, this was around 1936, so JPL predates NASA. Um, so because of this unintended explosion, this cool lab started, and in 1958, when NASA formed, they asked for JPL to join the team. Um, so you might know JPL from our rovers and spacecraft in space. Basically, we specialize in robotic missions to space. Before people can go, robots go, and figure out if it's OK. Um, one of my colleagues said, if it has air, we don't care. I don't love using that, but I love that it rhymes. Uh, so yeah, here uh, you see the Curiosity Mars rover that just had its fifth anniversary. Um, and on the right, that is the spacecraft assembly facility where all of the spacecraft since the Ranger missions have been built. Um, JPL is also home to uh, the center of the universe, as we like to call it. It's mission control, uh, where spacecraft communicate in the deep space network. So anything that's flying beams down signals to JPL, and we communicate with the spacecraft. Um, so it's really the nerve center of all of, the spa all of space. Thus, we call it the center of the universe. Um, this is one of the deep space network dishes. So um, yeah. They beam down and up information, and we collect it and uh, communicate with space. One thing that really got me my job at NASA in the first place as a person working in the, in the media relations department was the NASA charter. So the NASA charter is basically saying that any information and studies that happen for NASA have to immediately be disseminated to the most amount of people, so the widest spread. Um, which helped me get my job by saying, hey, let me do that with cool content. Um, so I started working there and trying to think of cool and creative ways to kind of get this content across to people. Um, on the left here is a picture of the giant wind turbines inside of the NASA Ames Center, uh, which I helped shoot some 360 videos for. And on the right, that's me and Dave Duty, who is the flight operations lead engineer for the Cassini mission, uh, which I will speak about more later. Um, he was showing me how to beam up signals into space. Uh, and I got to press a button, talk to Cassini, and it was pretty cool. So. After making a bunch of content, um, we had these meetings in Silicon Valley with the social media group. And through that, I found out that there was an API coming out for YouTube and Facebook where you could take panoramas that for now looked like this and put them in a 360 degree space. So I started getting really excited and just got obsessed with the idea of figuring out how to make these things into a video. Um, 
in February, no, March of 2016, uh, we released the first ever 360 video for NASA on social media, which was called Curiosity Mars Rover at Namib Dune. It was a full panorama of the rover um, doing science at the Namib Dune on Mars. Um, in the back there, you can see Mount Sharp. Um, it was the first time this had been released, and it really showed how big the dune was. Like, it, there's no way to understand it from this picture. The bottom picture is what you're looking at. Can't tell what you're looking at, can you? But here you can. And um, I'll give a link in a little bit so you can check these out on your own. We just can't play back YouTube 360s in this slide deck. So um, after making this video, I decided that I needed to basically make something big for each mission operation. Um, so the next big mission that we had was Juno's mission to Jupiter, uh, which inserted into the orbit of Jupiter last 4th of July. Yes, NASA loves to do stuff on big American holidays. They're like, America, 4th of July, let's do this. Um, so I wanted to make a video that showed not only what it would seem like to fly along with the Juno spacecraft, and, but also to see how big Jupiter is in that perspective. And this Jupiter data um, that you see slightly in this is from the Galileo mission, um, which was flying at Jupiter from 1983 and then deorbited into the planet in 2003. This, um, this movie also kind of helped me uh, to do a more exciting stuff. So I found out that they had 3D CAD modeling of inside the spacecraft. So I was like, let's take people inside the spacecraft to look around. So in here, you get to see all of the instruments that exist, as well as the three passengers that are on board the Juno spacecraft, uh, the Roman god Jupiter, his wife Juno, and Galileo, the astronomer. Um, they're little Lego mini figurines that uh, are at Jupiter right now, and many people didn't know that we, we did this little secret thing. Um, so I guess this brings us to Cassini. Uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar that Cassini just ended its mission of 20 years on September 15th, that's last Friday. Um, so when the engineers and scientists at JPL knew that Cassini was running out of gas, as we like to say, um, our really amazing orbital mechanics engineers figured out that before Cassini was gonna deorbit, they could do this amazing feat of engineering which is, having this, which is having the spacecraft fly between the planet and the first set of rings. I immediately jumped at the opportunity to make a 360 about this. So in this 360, you're flying with the Cassini spacecraft alongside it as it kind of passes through the rings. Um, in this resolution, you can't see it, but if you look really closely on YouTube and zoom in, right to the left, you see this little speck of dust. Uh, it looks like dust on your screen, but it's actually us. It's the whole entire planet. Um, this was made in collaboration with a really awesome animator called Eric Vernquist from Sweden. Um, we can update this with new data because we actually have the data now. Uh, we kind of had to take some guesses. And we have higher resolution photos of Saturn. So this project kind of keeps on living. Um, I promised you a link if you guys want to check out the 360s. I made a bit.ly shortened link, so please go ahead and check it out. You can also just go to youtube.com slash NASA JPL, but these are best uh, viewed in 4K on, on, on your, on your um, phone or on a desktop. Not in GIF format, but I'm doing the best I can. <laughs> um, so after making the 360 jump, I kind of became obsessed with the idea of virtual reality. It brought together this, uh, this art and science world in a perfect combination for me because I was able to art direct and animate these things that were uh, kind of not able to be visualized before. Um, so recently, actually, while after I, after I was asked to be at this uh, conference, um, I got a job in the ops lab at JPL. Um, so the ops lab is a kind of a skunk works or a startup inside of JPL, um, specializing in software development. And that software development is all in virtual reality, primarily using the HoloLens device. Um, I'll let you know what I'm talking about in a second. So I'm going to go through like a few of the projects that we have going to kind of help you figure this out. Um, the first project I want to talk about is Protospace. 
So Protospace is a 3D CAD modeling visualization tool. Using the HoloLens, you can take your CAD models out of your computer into three-dimensional three space and real-time edit them. So here we have an example of a person looking at a model, another person pointing things out and changing them. So we bring 3D designs into the world and solve problems before they're real. One really good use case for this was one of our Mars 2020 engineers saw the Mars 2020 rover and he actually tried to put his hand in between a place he would need to reach before um, packing up the rover to send it to Mars. Um, and he realized that his hand didn't fit in there. So like a really simple problem solved by this 3D visualization tool. Um, so this is another example of people working things out. It's funny because we have to kind of take these photos through the HoloLens, but usually my work, people are just staring into nothingness going like, wow, it's kind of amazing. Um, so we're taking that idea into an even further bounds of um, making formulation software for engineers. So basically, Lego pieces that you can put together and possibly even put into inertial space to see how they work. So this is me and some of my group members working out some problems. Um, the next step for, for Protospace is um, actually putting it into the ISS. So this is Scott Kelly in the International Space Station with one of our devices. Um, we sent one up last year. So the idea here is to help the crew on the ISS do different um, tasks while having someone guide them through it, but also having an animation play. So it, there's a less margin of error, even though you're trained through it. So empowering the crew with assistance when and where they need it. Um, we're still working this out. It's very much in the formulation phase, but it's really cool that there is a HoloLens up there, and we've already been doing some great work. Um, the third and kind of most exciting, or I shouldn't say that, I shouldn't judge the projects, but I'm excited by it, is, is Mars. So this is what engineers and scientists used to see before when they looked at a picture of Mars to get depth. This is an anaglyph, so if you think way, way back into the 80s uh, when they had the red and blue glasses, we still use them. I actually think they're pretty exciting. My, my talk picture is an anaglyph of Ceres. I was like, someone will have glasses. Um, so this is how they kind of try to get depth and perception of Mars. Um, now you don't have to do that anymore. Using the HoloLens device, we take data from the Curiosity rover and from Mars orbiters, compile that together into a mesh, a 3D mesh, and then our scientists meet virtually on Mars and have meetings about next points they want to see. So we enable scientists to work on Mars from their offices. We just had one of our bigger multi-user sessions, 11 people just running around on Mars being like, look at this, look at that. It's really quite the experience, and I hope to be able to demo this for you someday. Um, but when you put on the device, you can like look under rocks and explore and get down on your knees. It really is the depth of um, more depth than we've ever had, mainly because of Curiosity's data. Data, excuse me. So. My side of this is also, how do we put this into the public's hands? How do we re reach out to the public and use this? Um, we made an experience based on the 3D mesh, and you might recognize that man on the left, Buzz Aldrin. Um, we made a version of OnSite called Destination Mars, also a HoloLens program, but it debuted in the J Johnson Space Center Museum, so people could actually get a tour of Mars featuring Buzz and also Arissa Hines, who is a rover planner for the Mars Science Laboratory, or Curiosity. Um, in this experience, Buzz is actually a hologram, so he had to be scanned. Um, it's pretty cool. Hopefully, um, we'll take this kind of experience and be able to disseminate it more around the world, mostly working with museums, and that's something like I'm interested in talking to anyone about. Um, so again, taking these applications and putting them into the real world. Another um, project that I was part of was working with this uh, company. It's an MIT-based startup called Rendever. Um, they basically take virtual realities and put it into senior homes. Because people of this generation really grew up in the heyday of space, um, they asked, we want to go to space. Um, so this is a video that I received recently of uh, them looking at space of the 360s I made for the first time. I don't know if they're terrified or like happy, but um, the feedback was that most of them did tear up and cry because they, they'd always wanted to fly in space and they were finally able to do it. So I want to reiterate one thing, or I should say it for the first time, I didn't say it yet. Um, so all of the, all of the 
products that we put out um, are available for you to use. This includes any picture that any spacecraft takes, any content we put out. We encourage people to take it and make their own things with it. It's in the public domain. Um, so in this link, you can follow uh, this link to the Museum Alliance page for JPL. And you can download every single 360 I've ever made. There are 12 of them, I believe and do whatever you want with them. Experiment with them, glitch them out, um, fill in the blanks if you want, um, because a lot of times Curiosity takes only terrain images and doesn't image itself or the sky. So we have some really cool artists out there that, that work with um, filling in those blanks of what it could be like if we took those photos. So it's a really exciting thing. Um, so as I round out this talk, um, I know that I work at NASA, and that seems really cool, but my point always is that anyone can do this. And uh, no, I, actually, someone earlier today said, you don't seem like a person that works at NASA. And I was like, what do you mean by that? Because really, couldn't anyone do this? Um, these are some letters that I received after doing a talk in an elementary school, kind of about the same idea of being able to be an artist and work in the science field. If they got the information, I feel like anyone can. I also am expecting letters from each and every one of you um, thanking me for doing this, <laughs> with cool pictures also, like this. Um, so one thing that really inspires me, and I don't usually do quotes, but I think this one is very special, and it's also Carl Sagan, so can't really go wrong. Um, he was quoted as saying, imagination will often carry us to worlds that never existed, but without it, we go nowhere. And that's something that really carries me through my job because without imagination, nothing exists. So I don't think anyone can say you're bad at art or you're bad at math because we all understand this theory together. And I think that if we combine our skills and are able to collaborate and create content, really anything is possible. Shoot for the moon and beyond actually. So um, with that, I wanna say thank you. Um, again, there's the link for the YouTube. And if you wanna follow me online, and bother me with questions. It's not a bother at all. I'm there for you to answer anything you'd like. Um, and if you have any questions about supplementary content about this talk, I'd be happy to share them with you. So I think with that, I will be ready to take some questions. Thank you so much. Brilliant. That was amazing, Sasha. So inspiring. Thank you. Well, look, I'm going to. Uh, I'm going to abuse my right as host to kick off with a question. Okay, cool. That's all right. yeah, yeah. Get yours posted up. They're going to appear on the screen like these ones are, so keep them coming. Um, I have a question for you, Sasha. There's a, an amazing film that's just come out that I recommend to all of you called The, the Farthest, and it's about the Voyager space uh, probes and mission. One of the things in that film that's interesting to me is the tension between art and communication yeah. and science, yeah. because uh, the resources matter. Do you spend it on science or on communication? Mm -hmm. And sometimes scientists feel that there's a, there's a sort of dumbing down or a simplifying through communication. Mm -hmm. uh, is, that, is that still a, that film is really about a mission that started 40 years ago. Yeah. Is that still a live debate with the NASA? And how do you, how do you get through it? I think it's how you sell the idea, right? I think because of um, more of these projects being in the public eye because of social media, there is an understanding with scientists and engineers that didn't really exist before. Right. So they kind of get it. You're like, oh, I made this thing and like this many people saw it. And they're like, oh, that's cool. That'll help me do my next paper. So oh, really? right. I think that, that, that tension is less so. Yeah. Um, and I think that the, the people that I work with at JPL are really thankful for kind of the help that they get from the art side of things. Really? Um, yeah, of course, there, there are other tensions, but I like to be air on the side of optimism. <laughs> Good, me too. Yeah. All right, so uh, loads of questions coming in and uh, keep going. So um, let's, let's, talk, uh, let's take David's question. Um, could you imagine giving the public the opportunity to sort of have a VR ride through space? Or yeah, I mean, I mean, the idea with the 360s is like the easiest way to do that was to just put it on YouTube as that API came out. Um, we're working on taking all of the things that I showed you, except maybe protospace, which is a bit more kind of for industry. But um, I could see it working for architects as well. Um, but taking some of our stuff and putting it into web VR, for instance, to putting it more into utilitarian places so everyone can kind of have access. So we're kind of in the process of doing these things. Right. It's still like a very new world. Um, and I'm looking forward to being part of 
helping do the public virtual reality rides. Yeah. Cool name, David. Great, on name. The <laughs> um, great question from Clara. I mean, all great questions. Um, how can how can artists find opportunities in the space field? Any tips having, uh, having, having <laughs> gone through the I last? say be very, uh, so I think that you, for me, it was knowing what I wanted. So I knew I wanted to work at JPL. I actually applied to JPL through LinkedIn blindly 100%. I saw the listing and I was like, this is my dream job. This is my dream job. Like I went through everything. I was like, I, this is me. And I just wrote a cover letter that was like, Thank you for writing a letter about me. So I'm ready to come in whenever you guys. I was just very arrogant about it. But I think they saw my experience and my boss was like, you seemed very interesting. And they needed someone with a creative mind. Um, I would say also kind of meeting up with people that do kind of work. I think virtual reality is a great place to meet people that are kind of from both worlds. So finding places like that too and events to kind of like mingle and talk to people. Really every job I've gotten has been by coming up to someone and being like, hey, can I have this job please? And they're like, why are you asking me? And I'm like, I'm great, right? And you know, it's just that confidence. And I mean, a bit of luck, I suppose, but the more you start doing it, the more you realize people don't really approach people with this like, I want to do this and and I know what I'm doing yeah. attitude. Or like, I don't know what I'm doing, can yeah, you teach yeah, yeah, me? Yeah. Which is sometimes more fun. And there are a couple of organizations in London that are really good for this. There's one called Super Collider, who I work with a lot. Uh, they, they work with artists uh, to bring science to life. Uh, and also the Wellcome Trust in London, which funds a lot of work in that area. Um, Anonymous, uh, might be Elon Musk <laughs> sitting somewhere in the audience. Where is asks, he? Uh, do you think humanity will leave Earth one day? I'm going to read that as, um, you know, all, all of, of us, us leave. Yeah. Um, I'll probably not be around for that unless I'm a hologram, uh, which I'm working on. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I actually don't know the answer to that. That's my favorite answer to things, yeah, actually. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Um, anonymous, I would love to hear your take on that. Um, Where is Anonymous? <laughs> Anyway, come and, come and find scared. us at the end. <laughs> yeah, I'll talk to you about it. All right, Anonymous 2, <laughs> uh, great, great question as well. What, what's the biggest challenge with, with your work, Sasha? I mean, it's um, all so amazing, but uh, what do you find you know, most uh, difficult and possibly also most rewarding as a result? I mean, I think in the, uh, to take it to a mundane thing, because this is a talk where I'm like, it's amazing, but day to day, I mean, we create software, so, I'm helping make sure we're on our agile method correctly and that we're produ like making the customer happy and right. you know uh, kind of like producing the whole thing. So the biggest challenge is making sure that we have this vision that we're sticking to and that we're on time with making everyone happy and yeah. also making sure that all of the employees are happy as well. So I mean, it's kind of the, the boring part of work, but it's the work part of work. Um, and I also think it's the most challenging part of work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Very cool. Um, Thomas asks a, a, a great question, which is, you know, what's the interplay between your work and, you know, funding for NASA? Obviously, so important that NASA yeah. gets, gets funding. Uh, is that is that an explicit? It is. Aspect? So um, I think that in my in my first position, all of the social media and all of the outreach, and actually even beginning to do these 360s, uh, NASA headquarters loved this and they can take this and say like, look at what we're doing and then get funding um, from different departments. In terms of government funding, we receive less than 1% of the government budget. So that's not up to us, that's up to uh, the pol politicians and that's all I'll say about that. Yeah, well, it's an amazing thing, NASA. Yeah. Um, let's, uh, Anonymous asks uh, a very open-ended question uh, about music and science. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and actually NASA's got a really beautiful history of using music in interesting ways. But yeah, do you want to... So um, I snuck in my own music into all of the 360s and actually some music from my friends because we use a lot of rights-free music, um, but and people always try to give their things for us to use, but they have to be in, in rights-free and we can't give credit. So that's one thing, for JPL at least. Um, I think that music is really integral to kind of ingesting content, especially videos. I know that there are definitely some NASA-made videos out there with music that you're like, okay, like, <laughs> where did you get this? Like, what library are you using? Um, but I think that it really changes the feel of something. One thing that I, my friend said to me, um, who also works in VR and works in space communication, um, 
she was like, can't people just be quiet and let me float in space? Um, and I think that's there's yeah, something that's to be lovely. said for that because they're yeah. always like, look over there, that is this. And sometimes you just want to be like, this is all I want to do. I just want to do this. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. The last 360 that I put out was a, a flyover of the Dwarf Planet series, and I got away with having no narration, just music. Whoa. And that was like a huge win for me. Zen. Small win, but... Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Um, I'm going to take both of Philip's questions here together. Uh, yeah. We talked a bit about 360 video and VR. What about augmented reality? Yeah. And have you, have you played around with Magic Leap? Is that something you're going to be? So Magic Leap, yes, we're doing experiments with that. Um, I think we try to test out all the new tools that are coming out and even use older tools to try and like kind of like soup them up and uh, make them ours. Uh, mixed reality captures. Um, so we do do augmented reality at, uh, at JPL. Um, we actually have an app called Spacecraft 3D, which is free. And it shows you all of the flying missions that we have in space. Um, in augmented reality, you just have to print out the target and you can see every spacecraft, as well as like see how um, the different phases um, uh, t take apart in space, basically. Yeah. Um, in my in my department, we are working on augmented reality stuff, but right now we are really focusing on the HoloLens work with mixed reality. Cool. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, good question from Anonymous here. What's the coolest thing you've seen at NASA? Oh, gosh. Um, so one thing that was cool is I got to meet BB-8, um, like the actual BB-8, and take a picture with him in the spacecraft assembly facility. That's like more of like a fangirl thing. <laughs> um, I think the coolest thing I've seen, mostly my coolest things are interacting with people, and we were talking about this a little bit. I got yeah. to meet Dr. Ed Stone, who is part of the Voyager mission. Voyager was the reason that I became interested in space, and he was like asking me questions at a meeting, and I was like, oh, like, <laughs> Why are you talking to me? And he's like, I'm interested in your opinion. And it was just this moment that I was like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. It's very Yeah, real. my Mick Jagger, as I said to you. I was yeah. just like, this is amazing. So I think it's really the people. I mean, yeah, mission control is awesome. The spacecraft assembly facility is awesome. But um, it's really the people that are yeah. the most interesting. Yeah. And Sasha, tell me, the um, tell us a bit about some of the missions you've got coming up. So Cassini's just come to an end. Yes. What should we be looking so, out for? One thing that you should be looking forward to is the Mars 2020 mission, which will have another rover. Uh, right now it has a sample return capability, so it will be able to, right now we're saying it can cache samples and those might come back to Earth at some point. Um, kind of a Curiosity 2.0, really yeah. like fixing the problems that Curiosity had and, and doing a lot more science, kind of getting ready for the human part of Mars exploration to start. Um, speaking of Mars, we also have a mission launching next year called InSight, which is just a lander, so it's not as sexy as a rover, but I think it's cool because um, it's going to measure the te core temperature of Mars, the Doppler, uh, so how Mars rotates, and also it's going to measure Mars quakes, which, Whoa. like, what's shaking on Mars? I don't know. We don't know. So it's going to take a bunch of scientific data basically to help us understand we formed at the same time as Mars, and why does Mars look like Mars does? Insight's going to help fill in a lot of those questions. Mm. So I'm excited for that mission. I'm excited for that mission. Yeah, and also Europa, which is we don't have a we don't have a launch date for that yet, but um, that's one of the ones I'm really excited about. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, so many good questions. Um, uh, I'm going to take the top anonymous question here. Please keep them coming. Keep firing them in. Um, uh, the question is, NASA had involvement, uh, yeah. uh, contributed to Hollywood films like The Martian and Interstellar. How, Sasha, do you guys balance accuracy, education, which obviously matters, with storytelling, which yeah. matters too? Actually, The Martian, we had a huge hand in helping with that. Um, a lot of our JPL scientists and engineers advised on it. JPL was prominently featured in the movie. If you, we, they had like chrome gates, and we all watched the movie, and we were like, that is not what JPL looks <laughs> like. But can we have that, please? <laughs> um, so yeah, they were Hollywood. There's actually a Hollywood um, science exchange, especially being based out of LA. Uh, right. That is something that's really real. So they talk to us, and we approve all of their content in terms of The Martian and Interstellar. We worked really closely. Uh, also with Wally, we worked really closely. Right. Um, and uh, yeah, I know that Hidden Figures. It wasn't our center, but um, they worked closely with like JSC and things like that. Right. So. Um, I guess the bottom line is that, that Hollywood does care about scientific accuracy, yeah. and they usually do work with us to, to get that right. 
And The Farthest, this documentary film that I'm obsessed with, which wasn't sort of Hollywood per se. But, yeah. Um, Again, NASA was very involved and... Oh, yeah, yeah. We advised on that as well. Yeah. Amazing film. <laughs> um, a question from, from Mark, uh, oh, yeah. which uh, I strongly agree with as well. I know, Mark. The old typography and design of NASA, which is so cool and optimistic and retro-futuristic. Could you bring that back? Could you The worm? You're talking about the worm, right? Right, Mark? Um, yeah. So there was a great, actually, my friend helped crowdfund this project, and her boyfriend helped design the, the graphic book of all of the old uh, graphic typography. I can't bring it back. Actually, the meatball, as we call it, uh, which is the logo right now, is was the first logo. And then it went back, went to the worm, and then it went back to uh, the meatball. Okay. Right. Uh, beautiful name, the meatball, meatball's right? Meatball's great. Meatball's great. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I don't know. I, I guess I can put a ticket in the in the suggestions box at work. Uh, <laughs> but I don't know if anyone's going to listen to me. <laughs> um, great uh, question from Anonymous uh, again. Um, are you involved, Sasha, and is your team involved in any way in the interfaces that the engineers and astronauts use? Because clearly, you know the you know the the quality of user interface mm -hmm. design and um, yeah. and the role of art and music in that. Yeah, so UX and UI is a huge part of what we do. There's a lot of user research that goes into creating the virtual reality tools that we have. So there are documents upon documents of people just sitting down and getting use cases from people, especially with the astronauts. Um, we actually go and see how their formulation works and, and then take notes from that and kind of come back and have design simulations and, and make sure we get all of that data. So really, we're making it for them, so we want them to be the happiest with the design. So design is a huge process. Actually, that goes back to the challenges, like the challenges, design, and development balancing. Um, but they're both like very important, and we definitely it's a huge part of our process. Very cool. Uh, so many great questions. We've got two minutes left, so fire up any last any thoughts, ah. inspirations uh, for, for Sasha. Or we could just sing. Can't we, we just, just sing? We could just sing. sing. We can get the stage rotating. <laughs> no one's been singing in these things. I don't know why. Do you want to start? <laughs> uh, yeah. So a question from uh, Anonymous, and feel free to okay. sing yeah. or yodel. <laughs> an answer to this. Um, are, you, are, you a, are you a, uh, uh, a fan, Sasha, of art history? And to what extent uh, does the history of art sort of inform, you know, your work, which is very forward-facing? And yeah, I mean, it does. I art history was my favorite thing in school. I think, um, especially ancient art history. I think that connects with space really well in this nice way. Um, so yeah, I think to to make anything new, you have to be informed and and basically know what happened in the past so that you don't think you're creating something new, but that you're actually building on this thing that exists. And I think that's actually more beautiful than yeah. being like, I created this idea all by myself. It's like, no, you didn't. Um, but you need to know intelligently how to speak about the past. So yeah, yeah, yeah I am a huge fan of. Uh, anonymous is as I don't know if it's the same anonymous, just prolifically uh, say your name. Throwing, in, throwing in questions, but uh, great work, all of you. Um, what's your biggest dream, Sasha, to create in, in your role? What would you love to have the budget, the time to, yeah. to get your teeth into? Well, I mean, actually, one dream, it's Voyager related. Um, so Voyager still downlinks uh, data. It takes all of the deep space network to point all of the antennas to get this very light signal from Voyager. Because it's what they're both 10 billion miles from. Yeah. Earth. So Voyager one is in interstellar space. Um, if you did not know that, that's very far away. Um, we don't know how much longer we're going to be getting signals from it. But I always thought it'd be cool to make an experience using the data that is. We can't really, it doesn't really take data yet, but kind of like working with a specialist to make a VR experience where you can like wormhole back and forth in time and be where Voyager is or be back on Earth. Oh. Yeah. Oh. So if anyone wants to fund that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Probably no. someone here. Someone waving. Oh yeah, there's a guy. Yeah. So yeah. cool. Right, done. <laughs> I think you're just waving at someone. Yeah, I think, yeah. Uh, well, we'll take Too that. Bad, yeah. We'll take that as a commitment. Everyone saw it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Listen, um, I think you'll agree that was a properly amazing vision, uh, set of ideas, and, uh, and, and talk there by Sasha. So please give a big uh, meet convention. Thank you to yeah. Sasha. Just taking a video. Here we go. Uh.
Thank you. Thank you so much. If you have questions, come on up after. And Sasha, very kindly as well, has. Uh, is, we're going to be handing out stickers, NASA stickers. Uh, I've already nabbed one. Uh, NASA stickers for all of you. Now, up next, in about 10, 15 minutes' time, we're going to go from space to Earth, and we're going to be talking about the future of farming and food production in our cities, in our towns, in our offices, in our homes. Uh, so please come back here, if you fancy it, in 10, 15 minutes' time. Thanks.